Hi, I'm Andrew. Hi, and I'm Denise. And today, we're going to be talking to you about food chemistry. So in this video, we're going to go over six connections between food chemistry and our grade 12 chemistry course. Okay, so the six concepts and topics that we're going to cover in this video from our course are reaction of organic compounds, structure and properties of substances, classifying organic compounds, changes in energy, rates of reaction, and acids and bases. And for those of you following along at home, those can be found in chapters 2, 4, 1, 5, 6, and 8 in your textbook. So have you ever noticed that when you cut open an apple, after a while it begins to turn brown? You probably also notice that covering it with the juice of a lemon, for example, prevents that browning. Today, we're going to take a closer look at this. So I have with me an apple, which I'm going to cut in half. <coughs> and one half we're going to leave uncovered, and the other half we're going to cover in lemon juice. And we're going to see what happens to these two pieces of fruit over the next little bit. That was the one with lemon juice, and this one's the one without. As you can see, after just 20 minutes, the difference between the two halves of the apple is very noticeable. The half that wasn't covered in lemon juice is very brown, while the other half that was covered in lemon juice, it looks like as if it's just been cut. So why does this happen? Well, apples, like most plants, contain an enzyme known as polyphenol oxidase. So when the apple is cut, this enzyme is released from the cells and undergoes an oxidation reduction reaction with oxygen. As you know, oxygen is a very strong oxidizing agent. So when it reacts with polyphenol oxidase, it is reduced. While the enzyme is oxidized, this produces a brown, black, and red polyphenol or pigment that is, called, that is the cause of browning. So how does the lemon juice prevent the fruit from browning? Well, it does this in two ways. Firstly, it contains ascorbic acid, which is much more reactive with oxygen than polyphenol oxidase is. This causes the oxygen to react with the acid before it can react with the enzyme, preventing the fruit from browning. Secondly, lemon juice has a very low pH, around 2. Polyphenol oxidase, however, is most reactive when the pH is between 5 and 7. By lowering the pH, the enzyme is deactivated, preventing it from reacting with oxygen and preventing the fruit from browning. Have you ever boiled pasta only to have it overflow? Well, the next time you're boiling pasta, you should add a little bit of olive oil. This, helps, this should help stop the overflowing. So how does this work? Well, to answer this, we need to look at the structure of olive oil. Olive oil is a fatty acid and also a non-polar substance, and conversely, water is a polar substance. And we know that non-polar substance can only dissolve in non-polar substance, and polar substance can only dissolve in polar substance. So since olive oil has a lower density than the water, a film of olive oil is created. This should help stop the overflowing. You may have also heard that olive oil can be used to prevent the pasta from sticking together. But why does it stick together in the first place? When the pasta is added to the water, granules of starch, a type of carbohydrate, swell up on the surface and pop. The surface of the pasta then becomes covered in starch, which as we all know is covered in OH groups. The OH groups like to stick to one another, making it really sticky. The olive oil essentially lubricates the pasta, preventing them from sticking together. All this, however, comes at a price. Later, when you're serving the pasta, that same olive oil prevents the flavors and the sauces from sticking to the pasta, and in the end, you end up with a less flavorful dish. So, you're really just better off using a bigger pot to prevent the water from boiling over and stirring to prevent the pasta from sticking together. Since we're now in the topic of organic chemistry, we're going to take a little bit of time to go a bit more in depth into organic compounds. One of these organic compounds are your carbohydrates. Carbohydrates can be found in your bread, pasta, vegetables, and fruits. These carbohydrates could be broken down into more smaller components known as simple sugars. Some of these simple sugars are known as glucose, fructose, and galactose, but there are many more out there. Different combinations of these simple sugars create different carbohydrates. An example is your milk. In milk, you find lactose, which is a milk sugar, and is made up of galactose and glucose. Another example is your table sugar, also known as sucrose, which is a combination of fructose and glucose. So now we're going to talk about lipids. Lipids can be broken down into four main groups. Fatty acids, phospholipids, waxes, and steroids. But the one that we find most commonly in our foods is fatty acids. Now, fatty acids are those substances that we know as saturated fats, unsaturated fats, etc. But what exactly do these terms mean? Well, fatty acids are essentially long chains of hydrogen and carbon. 
The saturated fat is a fatty acid that has the maximum number of hydrogens, meaning that all the carbons are bonded to each other via single bonds. An unsaturated fat is a fatty acid that has less than the maximum number of hydrogens, meaning that some of the carbons are bonded to each other via double bonds. Now, now I have here with me two examples of fatty acids, butter and olive oil. Yeah, one of these is a solid and the other is a liquid. Why is this so? Well, butter contains mostly saturated fats. As we said, these contain only single bonds, resulting in very straight molecules. This allows the molecules to pack together very closely, resulting in high amounts of intermolecular forces and a solid at room temperature. Olive oil, on the other hand, contains unsaturated fats. And as we said, unsaturated fats contain double bonds, resulting in a molecule with a bent shape. This prevents the molecules from packing in as closely, reducing the amount of intermolecular forces resulting in a liquid. Our organic compound we're going to talk about is protein, which is found in your foods such as meat and meat alternatives. So the uh, proteins um, contain a functional group amines, which, are pre which is pretty much where the name amino acids come from. So amino acids are the basis of proteins. If you were to put a bunch of amino acids into a long chain, you'll get a polypeptide. These polypeptides are held by peptide bonds. So as you know, many of the reactions that take place in cooking are chemical, and as such, have an activation energy associated with them. As you've also probably figured out, many of these activation energies are quite high. Now this can be easily demonstrated in the cooking of an egg. Now this reaction will not proceed unless a lot of energy in the form of heat from the stovetop is present, energy which is required to break bonds so that new ones can form, changing the egg white from a liquid to a solid and from clear to white. Now there are also some reactions in which energy must be taken away, such as the making of ice cream. He must be taken away before the liquid can turn to a solid. Another example is the anti-griddle. As the name implies, the anti-griddle does the opposite of what a griddle does. Instead of having to heat things up, the anti-griddle is very cold and takes away heat to encourage exothermic reaction. An example of how the anti-griddle is used is placing some chocolate sauce in it and placing a stir stick in the sauce and it produces a chocolate lollipop. As you all know, chemical reactions have a certain rate associated with them. Now this rate is very important in baking, where it's important to ensure that things bake at the right temperature for the right amount of time. Now this rate, on which the time and temperature are based, is characteristic to the reaction and cannot be changed. Now this is why you can't bake things at double the temperature for half the time. So these cookies here are supposed to bake for 12 minutes at 375 degrees. Let's see what happens when we bake them for 6 minutes at 750 degrees. As you can see, these two cookies right here who, that look really good were baked at 375 degrees Celsius for 12 minutes. These two burnt cookies right here were baked at 750 degrees for 6 minutes. This tells us that the temperature and time cannot be changed because they are dependent on the rate of reaction, which is a characteristic of the reaction. The last topic we're going to discuss today is acids and bases. Acids and bases can be used in cooking and food preparation in order to achieve certain tastes and textures. Acids, for example, are quite sour, while bases are bitter and are slippery in texture. But how can you tell if something is an acid or a base? Well, you could always use an indicator made from food. Today, we're going to show you how you can use blackberries to tell if something is an acid or a base. Now, blackberries contain a naturally occurring pH indicator known as an anthocyanin, and this will cause the juice of the blackberry to turn red in an acid blue or violet in the base. Well, using blackberry juice as our indicator, we're going to test the pH of vinegar and the pH of baking powder. Okay, so since vinegar is acidic, we believe that the blackberry juice will turn pinkish or pinkish red since it's supposed to turn that color in acidic solutions. And for the baking powder, we believe that the blackberry juice will turn purple, violet, or blue color since it's an alkaline, which is basic. So we're going to go test it. So here's And now we're going to mix the baking powder. As you can see, it's turning a very blue violent color in the baking powder. So this indicates that, that the baking powder is basic. 
And here, as you can see, the vinegar, the blackberry juice turned very pinkish red, well, mostly red, so this indicates that it's an acid. So that concludes our video. We hope you had a good time and learned something as well. So to overview what went on in the video, we looked at structures and properties of substances. Classifying organic compounds. Reaction of organic compounds. Rates of chemical reactions. Changes in energy. And acids and bases. So thank you viewers for being with us for this time to study a bit of food chemistry. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.